Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you uh, about NILA and where we're going over the next few years. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join you live today, so this is pre-recorded. So if you do have any questions you'd like me to answer, uh, please email me via my email address at the bottom there. Um, I, I also share that email address on the last slide. If we're going to look forward, we actually need to look back a little bit as well. So over the last nine and a half years, there's been obvious improvements um, in patient care. So on the left here, things like 30 day mortality have improved from around 12% to what we will be about to, what we'll be publishing in November, less than 9% in the latest report. And that drop in mortality um, has been mirrored, if you like, by improvements in several process measures. So things like admission to critical care has risen from around 70% to getting towards 90% in high risk patients. Similar improvements have been seen in things like um, consultant presence in theatre from both anaesthetists and surgeons and consultant input before surgery. However, despite those improvements, there's been some areas where there has not really been improvement and there's been persistent challenges. And those persistent challenges are predominantly around the wider perioperative care. And the areas that we're particularly going to be concentrating on over the next few years are things like sepsis and access to theatres, and particularly where those two groups uh, combine, if you like. So the patients that are septic on admission aren't getting antibiotics quick enough and aren't getting th to theatres quick enough for urgent source control. And to that effect, um, the College of Radiologists uh, and College of Emergency Medicine are supporting the appointment of NILA leads uh, in ED and radiology in, their hos in the hospitals. So there will be additional NILA leads to support you in uh, delivering some of these improvements. And there will also be some data set changes that uh, will hopefully highlight some of these areas a little bit better. So whilst at the moment it can, it can be a little bit difficult to pull out some of the really urgent septic patients from the whole bigger data set. Some of those more specific data set changes that we're planning to introduce will mean it will be easier to pull apart and pull out these patients so that you can find out what's happening to them. Elderly care is another area where there needs to be increased focus. Um, elderly care input has doubled, but that's gone from about 12% to 25%. So it's still not great. And some of that is undoubtedly from best practice to tariff. Risk scores is another area where we'll see slight changes. So in the old days, it was all about possum. Um, so these are calibration plots. And whilst possum performed reasonably well sort of down the bottom of the curve, uh, um, at around 10%, as mortality increases, possum over predicts. So it wasn't particularly helpful from a point of view of decision making. So that was replaced a couple of years ago by the NILA risk score. Um, and this risk model the calibration of which is far better. So you can see that line of direct fit is far better matched by our, the patient cohort. So if you're still using possum, please stop uh, because it will give you, to some extent, inaccurate results from the point of view of clinical decision making, but it also mean the patients that you might be identifying as high risk are different to the patients that NILA identifies as high risks because we use the NILA risk calculator. So that NILA risk calculator is being refined further. So at the moment, um, the NILA risk calculator still uses the full tranche of uh, possum data points. So they're still sort of getting on for over 20 data points to derive the NILA risk score. So we've been working on a parsimonious risk score, uh, which is shown on the left-hand side in this red box. So this uh, is a risk score, a risk prediction score that only uses nine data points. And the calibration plot is as good as the using the full, uh, the full range of 24, 25 data points. So from the point of view of clinical decision making, the parsimonious risk score will mean you don't need quite as many data points to come up with a good estimate of the patient's risk. However, for risk adjustment, we'll still be using the full 20 odd data points. But if you're still using possum, please stop. 
the bit that isn't uh, currently in COVID, uh, sorry, the, isn't currently in the risk prediction score is COVID. Um, the interim report we published earlier this year gave us some insight into the effects of COVID on mortality. So if you don't have COVID, your standardized mortality rate was actually 0.85. So your mortality compared with the NIDA risk score was better than that predicted. If you did have COVID, your mortality is 1.25 times the predicted that predicted by the NIDA risk score. So obviously COVID worsens your outcome, but more work's needed on this because there's clearly two groups here. There's patients that are admitted with florid COVID symptoms, if you like, and happen to need a laparotomy. But there's also patients that are admitted with abdominal symptoms, need a laparotomy, and either happen to have just very mild COVID symptoms or happen to have a COVID positive test and they're otherwise asymptomatic. And we need to pull this apart a little bit more because there's clearly differences between the impact of COVID on those, uh, on their outcome, depending on which cohort you fall into. The other area where there will be more emphasis is on the quality improvement side of things as opposed to the quality assurance. So just to give you an illustration of what that means in practice. So the QA side of it, the quality assurance is sort of this graph on the left hand side here. So this is length of stay and, you know, NHS England like this because it shows that length of stay was around 19 days and is now around 14, 15 days. So that uh, four days length of stay improvement is associated with around 40, 50 million pounds of annual savings. So from a quality assurance point of view, that's really useful. It's not that useful from a hospital point of view where you're trying to find out how you're doing. So what we also have is a quality improvement dashboard that anybody can access in your own trust. And it kind of works like this. Um, so for instance, it's the same length of stay data. Um, there's a bunch of lines in the middle that give uh, the hospital's median length of stay, which is this sort of slightly undulating line, national average, uh, AHSN average, uh, the average or median length of stay for hospitals of a similar size. And that's associated with a control limit, which is this sort of blue shaded area. Now, each of these blue spots represents a patient. And what the dashboard allows you to do is to click on one of these spots. It will then tell you the patient's a hospital number so you can actually pull the notes for these patients that are outliers and find out what happened to them. So from a quality improvement point of view this allows you to really delve into the patients that are responsible um, to, for your longer length of stay and see if there's any issues associated with them that could be improved. The other area that is also currently available is real-time mortality tracking. So we use Yuma charts, which is exponentially weighted moving averages. They're similar to the uh, VLADs that uh, James Bedford showed earlier in the conference. So these are available now and, and essentially it's live mortality. So every time you add a patient, this graph gets slightly longer to the right hand side here. This pale blue line in the middle represents the predicted mortality of the patients in your hospital. And that is associated with a control limit, so that shaded area, which is this sort of wider shaded blue line. This darker line in the middle is the actual observed mortality. And what these Yuma charts enable you to do is, for instance, look at periods of time where the pale blue line is going down, so the risk of your predicted risk of your patients is dropping, yet the observed mortality was increasing. So if this dark line had continued and had passed above the control limit here, that would represent a time period where mortality was statistically an outlier. So these charts are live at the moment and the functions we will be adding will mean if, if that line exceeds the control limit, your NILA leads will receive an automatic email telling them that uh, uh, their live mortality tracking is suggesting that they've got issues with their mortality. So. You, you'll be able to look into it. And finally, the last area I want to talk about is uh, the NILA database from a research point of view. So there's over 175,000 patients in this database now, uh, and that clearly represents a huge opportunity for us to interrogate the emergency laparotomy patients further. 
So some of this is done in a sort of formal way. Um, so the NIHR sponsored trials, so EPOC that was, was already published. Floella is well along, along its way of recruitment, looking at goal-directed fluid therapy. LACES 2 is in the pipeline, which is looking at laparoscopic surgery for emergency laparotomy. And there's also um, an HTA, health technology um, trial funding available for rectus sheath catheters that will be in the pipeline. But the other real value is if you like the independent work. The NILA database is available to anybody, uh, you know, with the caveat being there's some IG issues that need to be uh, adhered to. But the NILA database is available to anybody that wishes to interrogate it if you've got a research question. So my invite to you all and is what do you want to look at in the NILA database to understand better uh, the delivery of care to NILA patients? Uh, it's available for you to look at. So just to summarise, there needs to be more emphasis on some of the persistent challenges around perioperative care. The in-theatre bit has kind of been sorted, but it's the bits before the patient gets to theatre and after they leave theatre that need greater emphasis. The needle risk score is going to be um, uh, refined further with the introduction of COVID uh, as a risk, risk factor, uh, but also the parsimonious risk score is on its way. There'll be more emphasis on the QI approach to improvement, um, but that really does require uh, that sort of timely engagement with your patients via your dashboard. And my last question, as I say, my last point was an invite to you. What do you want to research amongst the needle patients because that data set is available. If you've got any other questions, please email me, my email address below. Otherwise, thank you very much.